Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the book of Ezekiel. Uh, We've come to this uh, 22nd chapter, and we just finished the 25th verse. There's a conspiracy. Don't ever forget that. Well, what's the conspiracy? Well, it's a conspiracy of Satan working uh, against our Heavenly Father. And you have a choice. You, there's two ways, as we've learned, that you can pick the right way or you can pick the left way. That's up to you. And uh, so it is. He said, these, um, these uh, prophets in the midst of this conspiracy, they um, devoured souls. In other words, false teaching will destroy your soul, meaning it will rip the eternal life right away from you. And you're kind of doomed to hell then. And, um, but in this 22nd chapter, it's lacking the purification of metal. Your deeds are tested as by fire. And talking about silver, he says, most of my children are dross. That means old slag that gets thrown off the side. Worthless, no good. Um, and, and so it is, our father continues. We pick it up in verse 26, chapter 22, the great book of Ezekiel. Let's go with it as he continues uh, testing the metal of people. Verse 26 reads, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I am profaned among them. You know, this is a sad state of affairs. You don't have to look very far to understand that. You know, I'll I'll take the food laws for a moment. Very few churches teach the difference between the clean and unclean foods. And this has to do with your health, which is the habitation you have uh, for your soul here in these flesh bodies. You, you need to do it right. And many times they change God's word and work in traditions of man that as the New Testament declares, it makes void the word of God. Makes it profane. He doesn't like it. When, when God makes a simple, plain, understandable statement, he doesn't want some preacher, teacher, priest, prophet, messing with it. When God interprets something, that's the end of the story. Don't let man try to further interpret it. God doesn't like it. Verse 27, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves raving the prey to shed blood and uh, to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. you got like as Isaiah would say in chapter 3, you've got children as rulers. And they don't care about the people. They um, simply their own power, greed, and control. Verse 28, And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. That means they've whitewashed it. It looks pretty, but the first rain that comes, it's washed off. There's nothing to it seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, seeing, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. He says, I didn't send them. Well, I heard from God today. Oh, did you really? You know, it's one thing to pray, and it's something else. Um, <clears throat> I guarantee you, when God speaks to you, you probably won't be talking about it to anyone. It will be direct. It will have meaning. End of story. No interpretation. He does the interpreting. Verse 29. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery 
and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Anytime you rob people of the truth, you don't teach the true word of God, you know, you, you can be pretty safe in saying, thus saith the Lord God, if you teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But when you start um, adding to God's word, and when you start doing your own thing that is contrary to God's word, um, then you are oppressing the people. You're robbing them, absolutely robbing them blind especially if you have a reputation that they will believe and trust. You're a false teacher. And I'm glad that judgment begins at the pulpit. And it does. Verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me, for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. In other words, in those that were false, I couldn't find the one. And, and quite frankly, I, I can add to this by saying that Zedekiah, his ten sons, they're going to die. There's no man going to stand that gap. But he had two daughters that did. And as I told you, uh, on Veterans Day, we'll be showing that documentary. You don't want to miss it you find out that there was a woman that stood the gap. And, and from that, we have this King James Bible. One, Scotta, who would be Scotland, and another to Europe, which would, uh, from the, the proceeds thereof, or the, the progeny thereof, King James Bible, verse 31. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. You know, you don't, when, when you're unfair, you don't get away with anything. None of us are perfect, and we all mess up at times through misunderstandings, one thing or the other, or what have you. It just lets us learn to be a little sharper than what we are. You should be. You should be very careful to serve God. And so it is. Why? Because God's going to thump your gourd. You don't have to worry about getting too far out of line. And he'll straighten you out. And, and he doesn't waste much time doing that, especially if you, have, if you have bitten off responsibilities. Now, we're going to go into this 23rd chapter. It's rather graphic. I will warn you beforehand. Our Father likes for you to feel his emotions. And a flesh person can understand adultery a lot easier or quicker than they do idolatry because as adultery would affect a human being in the flesh, idolatry affects God the same way in heaven. In other words, he is jealous. He is jealous of those would, that would teach false religion. He's jealous of those that would practice idolatry or false things that are fed to his children. You mess with somebody's children and you can get their attention in a hurry. You mess with God's children and you'll get his attention in a hurry. So again, uh, uh, a lot of churches probably wouldn't even teach this chapter because it is so graphic. But you must always teach God's Word and do not apologize for God's Word because it shows you the very emotions. But I do want you to substitute idolatry for adultery. And you will better understand what it is the Father wants you to derive from this 23rd chapter. Chapter 23, verse 1, and it reads, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, verse 2, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. And let, let's get it straight. This, the mother is, is Mother Israel, and the daughters are the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Verse 3, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. 
there were their breasts pressed, and there they bruised the teeth of their virginity. They were molested in the natural sense. But what this means is they went off and they began to worship other things other than God. And, and God hates it. Verse 4. And the names of them were Ahola, the elder, and Aholabah, her sister. And they were mine. And they bear sons and daughters. Thus were their names. Samaria is Ahola. In other words, uh, Samaria is the ten tribes. That is Israel. And Jerusalem, Aholabah. Now, let's, let's understand what Ahola means. She has her own tabernacle or tent. But, and that would be the ten northern tribes. But the southern tribe, Jerusalem, the house of Judah, Aholabah, uh, my tabernacle is in her. Naturally, being the king line, uh, our, our father states that. And here you can see why God's own personal feelings are involved in this. Verse 5, And Ahola, ten northern tribes, Israel, played the harlot when she was mine. And she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors. And naturally she would be taken captive by the Assyrian 200 years before the house of Judah would. God doesn't like it, okay? When, when you uh, have other, when you have strangers with strange religions and thoughts, and you begin to partake it or bring it into your own um, uh, worship of Almighty God, he doesn't, he doesn't buy that. Verse 6, which were clothed with blue captains and rulers, ooh, they were lookers, I mean, all of them desirable young men, whoa, Horsemen riding upon horses, they cut quite a figure. Verse 7, thus she committed her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols she defiled herself. And of course, there's the prime root of the trouble. She worshiped their idols. It seemed like the thing to do. They seemed so gallant, they're so well-dressed, and so just, I mean, really hunks come riding right through camp. Why not? Right. But what it is is they have these foreign priests. There's nothing but heathen worship. And here you have, like, ones that would change Paschal, Passover in the New Testament, to Ishtar, which was a pagan holiday. And hey, it's adopted right into many churches. Uh, how strange people are that they would take in the idol worship. And that's what upsets our father. Verse 8, Neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt. For in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the breast of her virginity and poured their whoredoms upon her. Um, and, and so it was. This idolatry just took them over. They, they would even forget mostly the, the scripture of the living word. Verse 9, Wherefore I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians, upon, upon whom she doted them. And um, uh, here um, you have um, uh, what, what kind of people and what kind of religion. You see, when you start mixing religions, you, you um, dilute the very word of God and make it obsolete. You have to stand for something or you stand for nothing. And you must stand for the word of God. Um, her offspring, what is her offspring and what is her religion? She doesn't know who her children are. And most of the children today don't know who they are. They don't know whether they're of the house of, of Israel or the house of Judah or who or what. Verse 10, 
These discovered her nakedness. They took her sons and her daughters and slew her with the sword, and she became famous among women, for they had executed judgment upon her. And so it is. The enemy, God said, I'll, I'll let your enemies begin to take hope. 11, and when her sister Aholabah saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she, and in her whoredoms more than her sister in her whoredoms. This was the king line itself. They're supposed to know better. They were worse than the ten northern tribes. Verse 12, she doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers clothed most gorgeously, Ooh. and horsemen riding on upon horses, all of them desirable young men. And, and here this commerce of foreign religions just abounded. But it looks so religious. It seems so holy. Well, is it in God's Word? Well, no, then it's not. You must learn to separate the clean from the unclean that that is right from that that is wrong, from the true spirit to the false spirit. There is a conspiracy, and you must be able to separate and know the difference. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality, it's a way of life. Uh, 13, then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way. Uh, they, they, they followed, she followed her sister. The way one went, the other went in sin. 14, and that she increased her whoredoms. And when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion. Oh, my. Bright red. They look so good. So tempting. And, and, and convert it to the religious sense. It seems so holy. I mean, what a way to go. Verse 15, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, head uh, bands, all of them princes to look to after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. So you got a bunch of ragheads, okay? They've got the turbans right up there and the way it's going, and, and um, uh, so it is. But they look so religious. But they believe in killing each other, their own kind. Their ways are not our ways. And, and God doesn't like it. So you have to realize in their idolatry they begin to take on other religions and you must band, outlaw any false law from a free Christian nation that, that lives under common law, that is to say God's law instead of um, uh, foreign law international law, and so forth. Uh, for example, there are certain laws where you, you can beat a woman, I mean rock her to death, with stones. Uh, we, you can't allow that. God won't allow it. There are some times where they actually butcher and burn people. God never, it, Molochism never even entered his mind, he states in one place. But there are people in religion services that will do it. 16, and as soon as she saw them with her eyes, whoo, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them, unto Chaldea. I mean, she sent for them, advertised it. 17, and the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredoms, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. Her mind was taken over, and it breaks off from God's teachings and goes into the ways of confusion. 
Do you, you know uh, who the king of Babylon is in the end times? It's Satan. It's the wrong way. You don't want to go that way. And that's what idolatry will always lead to. It's one of Satan's main tricks is deception, deceit, lies, and, and to bring about the death of souls. And it would seem that some love it. They love to go with it. Verse 18. So she discovered her whoredoms and discovered her nakedness. And then my mind was annihilated from her. I didn't want anything to do with her. Like as my mind was annihilated from her sister. In other words, you can read in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, God divorced Israel. I mean, he wrote her out a bill of divorcement. And, and so it is. Uh, he won't mess with you. Verse 19. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. Even in her old age, she, she didn't forget it. She still played it. 20. For she doted upon their palomar, paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of ashes, asses, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. In other words, they're, they're like an animal. I'm going to translate it like it is. They're like an animal in heat. 21. Thus thou calledest to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth in bruising thy teeth by the Egyptians for the paps of thy youth. Uh, our Father, in this idolatry that keeps coming up over and over, false religion, false teaching, he hates it. That's why you always want to teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And that way, you know, thus saith the Lord God. Because when you follow his word, it's pleasing to him. And he will bless you. You go contrary to his word, and he will not bless you. You're out. Verse 22. Therefore, O Holabah, this would be the tribe of Judah, the house of Judah. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring them against thee on every side. Boy, are you going to receive a visitation. They're going to turn on you. 23, the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans. Pecod, that means visitation. Boy, are you going to get visited. And Shua, that means rich, wealthy. And koa, do you know what koa means? It means a he camel. And all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. I mean, looking good, looking impressive. Uh, what a, and convert this to the religious sense. Their religion seems so right, but it's false. You don't go there. 24, and they shall come against thee with chariots and wagons and wheels and with an assembly of people, which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I, don't miss this, this is God speaking, and I, will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments. That's not good. That's why you want to always realize that when you mess around with heathenism, and when you fall under their law and their religion, you're in a heap of hurt, friend, because they're not the land of the free and the home of the brave. Verse 25, and I will, not maybe, I will set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy nose and thine ears and thy raiment 
and and uh, the, and thy remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by the fire. In other words, these uh, this is heathen judgment, cutting off ears and noses, uh, uh, playing the harlot. Okay, they'll they'll cut you. They'll brutalize you when you go by their judgment. Verse 26, They shall also strip thee out of thy clothes and take away thy fair jewels. That leaves you pretty well empty. 27, Thus will I, they'll take everything you've got, in other words. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee and thy whoredoms brought from the land of, of um, Egypt, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. You're going to be out of the harlotry business, and I'm going to see to it. That's what our father is saying. 28, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver thee into the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hand of them from whom thy mind is alienated. I'm going to do it. You, well, well, why would God do that? You ask for it. You wanted them, get ready. Here they come. 29, if you want false religion, you're going to get it. 29, and they shall deal with thee hatefully and shall take away all thy labor and shall leave thee naked and bare and the name and nakedness of thy whoredoms shall be discovered, both the lewdness and thy whoredoms. In other words, this is, in a sense, is part of the apostasy. Do you know what's written in Revelation chapter 17, 16, the ten kings? They hate the whore. They really hate her. And what do they take away labor? You want to wake up and look today. Where is the labor force going? Is it being taken away or jobs going overseas? Where are they going? What's happening? Um, it's written. Have you read it? Verse 30. I will do these things unto thee, because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen, and because thou art polluted with their idols. And you want to be real careful when great ambassadors begin to take off for trade and, and, to, um, and to swoon and swan over foreign nations for trade and for input when you've got the best of everything right here at home. All you have to do is cultivate it. Do what's right. Get back into God's Word. Do what God would direct. Verse 31. Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, you too. Therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. Now it's a cup, all right. 32, thus saith the Lord God, thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup deep and large. Thou, th thou shalt be laughed to scorn and had in derision it containeth containeth much uh, the cup does of what god's wrath this is the cup jesus said father is there some other way we can bring in the second advent without pouring this cup of wrath out on those people because it's not pleasant and when you practice false religion you're going to drink it it's not pleasant verse 33 Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. You're both going to get it. And um, what God is kind of saying here, do you remember when many of them, <laughs> it's so religious, oh, Jesus, when you return, we're going to run to you and say, oh, Jesus, we've healed in your name. You know what he says? Get out of my sight. I never knew you, and, and so it is. You, you want to be real careful, the cup of communion. You better know what you're doing. You better know that it is Christ that paid the price. It is he 
that is worthy, not us. And, and you want to wake up to that fact because this cup is going to be poured out. And how pre what a precious moment that is. The great apostasy is coming. 34, thou shalt even drink it and suck it out and thou shalt break the shreds thereof, pluck off thine own breast, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. You're, you're even going to destroy your own occasion of whoredoms. You're going to do it to yourself. Why? Well, when, when you begin to see truth and realize where you're at, it's time to mature, to get back into God's Word and know we can be blessed instead of cursed. We, we can have God's blessings instead of drinking that cup of wrath. Uh, so wh which do you choose? Well, let it be known we choose the love of Almighty God to please Him rather than to make Him jealous, to stay away from false teachers, idolatry, and stay in the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. 35, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me and cast me behind thy back. Guess what he's going to do? Therefore, bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. Uh, verse 36, The Lord said moreover unto me, Son of man, wilt thou judge Ahola and Aholabah? Yea, declare unto them their abominations. You put me behind your back, I'm going to put you behind my back. You're, you're out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. That's what the Father is saying. When, when you take that step and go that far, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. You do not want to go there when you have the blessings of God available to you. And, and what a blessed, blessing it is to have his precious presence in your life, the sweet words of victory, knowing you've overcome, rather than to be deceived by the deceiver of all deceivers, the false one, and all of his little false ones that he sends behind him. You will always have that element that will try to tear down and to take away from the true teachings of God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Be warned, the cup is coming. You do not want to drink of it. Turn your back on Him, then He will tell you, get behind me and, and vanish. Okay, That's, guess where He put Satan? Get behind me, Satan. So, you stay in good cheer and know we have the victory. In the Word of God, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, thus saith the Lord God. He loves you. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend denomination or organization. We do not judge people. Our Father does that quite well. He knows where to put the cup, whether it be um, uh, the very blessings of God or the cup of wrath. It's, it's, he, he has that down real good. 
because he knows what we even think. Man can't know that. But man does have a gift from God. It's called spiritual discernment. It's, it isn't a big step to know right from wrong. It isn't a big step to know what's pleasing to our Father. So make sure that you fit that category. Once you do that, love him and he will return that love. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He does right now. He created your very being. Your DNA is different, your fingerprints are different, you're unique, because he wanted someone just like you but he wants you to love him. He may not love what you do always, and, and this is true. We, all of us mess up at times with misunderstandings, misleading, misguidings, but always repent, get back in his good standing, and be blessed. That's what's so ever very important. Why? He loves you, and he wants you to return that love. Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Rose from uh, Louisiana. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17. Please explain about the fat. Well, the Father says the fat belongs to me. Don't you eat it. Why? Because many of the poisons that an animal partakes of is stored in the fat. Okay. So, uh, this is one of the reasons you do not want to partake of the fat. As God would say, it belongs to me. Why? He doesn't want you eating it. It's not healthy. Tawana from Tennessee, you mentioned about nine priests that were buried in Tennessee. We're exactly in Tennessee, and can I go see this? No, no, no. It, this um, this uh, excavation took place. Uh, my mind is racing. It seems to me like it was about 1915 or 20, somewhere very early in this uh, in that century, and and um, now the very it's where the Back Creek Stone is found. So naturally, the location is Loudoun County, Tennessee, at Back Creek. Okay, and and um, the stone is now in the Smithsonian, so in Washington D.C., but. I, I am quite uh, happy that, and thankful that I was the one that translated the stone. I know there are other people that could have, and why they did not, I have no idea. But I do know what the stone said because it has a Maserati text on it. And, and um, you must, uh, as they were priests, you must be a scholar of the word to understand what it says. Okay. And what it, what it says being properly interpreted, it says, may the lion of the tribe of Judah be the poker that, uh, the voice of God that draws these firebrands back to God, okay? And, and those firebrands were God's priests. Uh, you can kind of get a feeling of that on Psalms 104. And the fact that the resh in the Hebrew tongue, the, that's the letter R, was facing east or right. And naturally, a resh is supposed to face left. But you see, because they were so far away from home, and when you pray, you're always supposed to face Jerusalem or face east. That's why it was doing that. You, could, you can understand that better if you read Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, May from New Hampshire, can Satan hear you when you pray? Please document. But nowhere is it written that he can, unless you are, um, if, unless he inhabits you with an evil spirit. Okay. But God can. God can read your mind. You don't have to say it out loud. He even knows what you're thinking. Um, he is, in the Greek, he is called the cardio nor. He knows your heart. Uh, Dana from... That may be David. I'm going to say that is David from Iowa. Will each of us have the have to face Satan directly? Please explain. Thank you. There are 
231 princes of the 7,000 of God's elect. There is a reason that those 231 are separated for out of the 7,000. I, I, it would only be a guesstimate, or you might call it an educated guess, but they would probably be the main witnesses, but trials will be held everywhere. And you will be delivered up, and the Holy Spirit will speak through each one. And there will be much more than 7,000, because there are the kings and queens of the ethnos that will also, because as, as the Holy Spirit spoke, just as it did on Pentecost Day in every language, it happened in the Gentile as well as God's elect. Holy from Illinois, which strong concordance do you suggest using? You know, we carry the very best, and I would recommend that you order it from us, and it, it would be about the same price you would have it anywhere else, and it is the very best you can have, less errors than any of them. Unfortunately, some of the Strong's Concordances, they have computer re, um, uh, formed them, and somebody goofed somewhere, and some of the Strong's Concordances, the numbers are off on in certain places. One of them is the is the um, is uh, Cain, and uh, that's rather peculiar that the numbers would go off there, but they are in certain ones. But the one we carry is that you will find less errors than any other uh, concordance. <clears throat> Question: Carol from California. Um, my question may have no real answer, however, with your knowledge of past heaven and earth ages, I can't help but wonder regarding the king of Tyrus, as stated in Ezekiel 28, 14, and 19, Satan was a high cherubim and guaranteed and guardian, rather, of the mercy seat of God before his fall. Did God appoint him there because of his great record of duties, or was he created to hold that position? He earned it. God never gives anything away free, okay? You always must earn it. So he was, at one time, he was very good, and you could almost be jealous yourself when God said, I, I made you the full pattern, and, and, because he earned those things. Um, whom God gives much, he expects much. But then it happened, as God gives all of us free will, because only when you have free will do you have true love. Love must generate within each entity. God cannot order it, he cannot command it, or you'd just be a zombie. Okay. It's, uh, it must generate within each person. He wants the real thing. And Satan fell. He began to get prideful in himself, as it's written in that 28th chapter, 18th, 19th verse. And he's turned to ashes from within, ultimately. Not yet, but ultimately. Okay, we got um, Michael from uh, Kansas. Uh, question, do you think there's a connection given in Jeremiah about the 70-year Babylonian captivity to Daniel chapter 12, verse 11? If we add 70 years to 1948, that's the time of the planting of the fig tree, you come up with 2018 uh, to Daniel's equation, and 18 equaling bondage. I study with you daily, has, have learned so much. Thank you. Interesting, we just have to watch, okay? We just have to watch. Um, and um, the... Uh, James from Missouri, what does Revelation 2013, the sea, give up the dead who were in it and, and death and Hades delivered up dead what were in them? Okay, well, what is the sea? You, you learn in the 17th chapter that the sea or the waters are the people. So from, from among the people, they give up those that are spiritually dead. You see, you've got to remember chapter 20, you're already in the millennium. Everybody is in a spiritual body. And this is not the judgment of the first resurrection, 
But this is the judgment of the second re resurrection, which is called the great white throne judgment. You don't make that one, and you're out. That's final. Um, that that is deserves the, not the first death, but the second death, which is the death of the soul. Nancy from California, a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Recently, a question aired as to where the U.S. of America is referred to in the Bible. My memory is faulty frequently, but I seem to recall that a few years ago you quoted passages from the Bible, America is the land divided by rivers, the Mississippi, Missouri, land of, uh, tall, of, of tall, clean shaved people. Um, you, you'll, without fences. But that's that's uh, Isaiah chapter 18. Okay, that's that's what you're reading from, and yes, that's where Israel, a large part of Israel, settled. That's why that America is so blessed. That is why that we are the superpower of superpowers. God blesses America. He certainly does, and um, <clears throat> he is not finished with her by any means. Kim from Texas. I enjoy your teachings and I learn a lot from you. My question is, I have medical issues since July that are very debilitating. I have prayed many, many times for healing, but have not received healing. What am I doing wrong? I pray that God's will be done above all else. So then anoint yourself with the all of our people. And when God hears you and touches you, um, that's the time it will come to be. You know, um, God promises, uh, how, how many people did he heal at the intermittent stream which the, the lame and diseased always waited at and when the water rushed in, they would, whoever was first in the water was healed. And Christ simply touched us once and said, hey, you're healed. He said, I don't have a man to take me down there. You don't need one. So God heals whomever he will, and there's a purpose for it. And so when you say his will be done, and we'll join you in that prayer, okay? Just um, know that God is in, on the throne, and when he's ready, that's when it'll happen. Billy from Tennessee, I am very interested in the end times during the millennium. Who will be living on the earth, and will they be in a spiritual body or flesh body? At the seventh trump, when Jesus returns to earth, does he remove the believings, believers, or do we remain on the earth for 1,000 years? Please explain. When, when he returns, <clears throat> all are changed into spiritual bodies. He is here on earth, and <clears throat> God's elect, as you read Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, they are priests for a thousand years, meaning you've got to teach. You're going to be a teacher. But during the millennium, all are in flesh bodies because on the first day of the millennium, millennium, Christ himself returns and every knee shall bow. Bow to who? To the Lord Jesus Christ. And because it's obvious he will have locked Satan away there will be no evil influence on the world. There will be no flesh bodies to tempt or to show weakness. People will be in spiritual bodies with 100% recall. Uh, uh, that by, I probably shouldn't say 100% recall. I pretty should say you will have the advantage of 100% of your brain rather than about 10%. Uh, as far as thought, knowledge, uh, remembering, and so forth. So you won't have to ask anybody if they know the word. They will. But discipline will be taught because many people that know the word, they cannot discipline themselves. They'll, they'll, you can fall off very easily, and I, I, we're, none of us are perfect. I want to make that clear. But there are some that uh, have a very hard time disciplining themselves. They can get off on jaunts and sidetracked and can be so misled so easily that it's a sad situation. And um, certainly that's what must be corrected is discipline, discipline, discipline. 
you show me a church that has no discipline and I'll show you a church that God does not bless. Well, how, how do you know when God blesses a church? When it grows and grows and grows and grows because the fields are white for harvest and the people need to be fed. Fed what? The word of God, not the word of a man, not this man or any other man, but the word of God. Have you read it? It's right there. And, uh, and with the unction of the Holy Spirit, how precious it is. Don from Texas, are the elect people men and women both, or just probably just men? No, it's men and women both. God is not a respecter of persons. And um, there, God has used women all down through the years. You know, let's take Judges, which follows uh, way early in the great book of uh, old, the Old Testament. Uh, judges, uh, there was one time where God couldn't find a man to judge. Uh, they had judges instead of kings, okay, for your information. He couldn't find a man to be a judge. But here came Deborah, and, and Deborah, God chose her, and she led Israel, and she led them in battle, and, um, and, and, and they overcame. Why? Because God was with her. There was Huldah at another place in God's Word who was over the University of God, the head schoolmaster, the head teacher of God's Word. And, uh, and um, all down through uh, God's Word, have, He has used whomever He chooses. Quite frankly, if even in the New Testament, if you, if you decipher in the Greek the names that Paul usually gives in his salutations, a large percentage of them are female, not male. Uh, why? They love to serve God and they love to work in the church. God knows who to use and who will work. Colleen from Georgia, where in the Bible does it explain our age in heaven and a child growing up in heaven. We, in heaven, we are all in spiritual bodies. And in spiritual bodies, we're all the same age. Because quite frankly, if, if you were to read the eighth proverb, the eighth chapter of Proverbs, wisdom speaks. And wisdom was with God before even the foundations of the earth. And he speaks of when God created his children. They were kind of all created at the same time. They're all the same age. But in spiritual bodies, there's no such thing as age. A spiritual body does not wither. It does not grow old. It does not age. It does not get sick, ill. Um, the only way a spiritual body can have a fallacy is to be misled. And uh, there are uh, bad spirits, and, and um, there are bad spirits on earth, and there are bad spirits in heaven. Some people just have a bad spirit. Every man, woman, or child has a spirit. And you can use your spirit, which is your intellect, and you can cast it and use it like to teach God's Word. I do. I love to let my spirit teach God's Word and put the emotions that carry through from the very Word of God. And, and, um, uh, and, and you can use that spirit for that, or some people that are just a little bit on the mean side, they can use it for something else, and it's not too pretty sometimes. But the, there are all kinds of spirits because that's people. But God loves His children. He does. And it is his, as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, what is it, verse 7 or 8, God is long-suffering, means he's got all kinds of patience. And it's his will that all come to repentance, because when you repent, all that bad stuff by your name in the book of life is erased. It's gone. And you have a fresh start. That's the price Christ paid for us. That's why you can't help but love him. Judy from Kentucky. Would you please explain Mark chapter 13, verses 15 through 18? Mark 13, 15 through 18, 
um, pray th that if you are on the housetop, do not go back in the house. You're not going to need to pack a bag. You don't have time to pack a bag. The end's going to happen where you won't need a change of clothes. You're there. And then as it could, would continue on into the next verse, woe to those that are with child in that day, meaning spiritually having played the harlot with the false messiah and have worshipped him and spiritually and only spiritually conceived and are even nursing along Satan's work, working in his church, okay? You want, want to watch that. And then pray that your plight be not in the winter, I think is 19. And well, why, why would you want to pray it's not in the winter? Well, when is harvest? You know, the end is harvest time. You don't want to be harvested out of season by the false Christ. So you want to pray that you're harvested when the true Christ returns. Jim from Louisiana. I'm so, that may be Iowa. Jim knows. What, what does this mean, question? The first Adam was made a living soul, and the second Adam was created a quickening spirit. And you're quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, what it means is that the first Adam was flesh, and he sinned. The second Adam, created by God, the only begotten, was the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was spirit. He was Emmanuel. He was God with us. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. You know why? Makes his day. And when you, little, little you, make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. It pleases him. Don't forget that. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. Listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, hey, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments, after these words of encouragement. John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. While we're between books, I want to do a lecture called The Election. Uh, we did it in the past, but I think it needs to be 